Welcome to the Black Sprayhood podcast. Today we're interviewing Alan Clammer and Heather Forrester. Alan is American, Heather is English. Heather has been crewing on Alan's boat and they're going to talk about how to make that crew skipper relationship work successfully. Heather is also going to talk about her experiences camper vanning in Europe and Alan was also a pilot and met President Kennedy. So, Alan, yes. can you tell us how you and Heather met? Well, we had mutual friends. Uh, Heather was, uh, we actually met in a restaurant. She had uh, crossed paths with another woman uh, on, on a, 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 yet a third boat named Brickhouse. And uh, we all gathered for dinner one night, and there was Heather. And the th first thing she said was she had traveled in her camper van for three months throughout Europe. And that really got my attention because it's so similar to cruising. So. We had a few meals and we talked and did some trips around the island of Karyaku together and ultimately I invited her to sail with me for a little while. She's going back to the UK in a few weeks and so uh, that, that's what's happened and here she is and we're getting on all right. So Heather, what made you decide to say yes to crewing? Well, again, it was just it was just that concept that that um, a motorhome in principle is very similar to to a sailing boat or a yacht in the sense that it's quite a confined area of space. Um, on the motorhome, I have to worry about fuel fuel to 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 make the the van go which you have to do on the on the boat if you're if you're motoring i have to worry about gas for cooking same here um water um getting rid of gray waste and, and black waste is slightly different on, on a boat but the principles are exactly the same so yeah new experiences fabulous so Alan, you normally uh, sail single-handed, yes. what are the challenges of that and what benefits has it brought to having Heather on board? Um, well, the two sides to that, um, I've been sailing my boat Gypsy for over three years, very much alone, I've had a, a couple of visitors, uh, but I've been alone now for several years and I rather like um, getting in touch with myself and living on my own and yet now that Heather's uh, visiting for a little while, she's a great help. She picks up tasks and even maneuvering the boat, helping with anchors and mooring, and of course, lots of great cooking. So that's been a real plus to have, uh, have someone capable of helping. And also the companionship is really nice. Heather, why do you think you and Alan have got along so well? Uh, oh, um, She's not sure. <laughs> no, no, I am sure. I mean, Alan's lovely to be with and really quite relaxed, and that's that's really nice. He lets me do things, help out, gives me some instruction, and that's quite nice as well because I don't just want to be sat here. I want to be doing things. I want to be learning things. You know, we're still learning throughout our lives, so so that's really really important. So I feel as if I can contribute and yeah we're a good company we have a laugh um, and and not to forget and I think this is really important I do work hard to respect the fact that this is his home and this is his boat so um, you know that's fundamental I keep putting myself in my position you know if I was on the motor home and got somebody there you've got your own rules your own way of doing things and you have to respect that and I think you know I work hard to try and do that um, so you, you both had let's say some bad experiences with other people on, on boats yeah so alan what recommendations would you give to people that are thinking of crewing or thinking of having a crew member on to make it work well thanks to social media i mean i've corresponded with several potential guests maybe not as much as i should if you're going to have someone on your boat or if you're going to go on someone's boat do a fair amount of FaceTime or WhatsApp time. Talk about all the things that, uh, the challenges that your guest might have that they're not familiar with. Have a lot of good communication. Now, we didn't have that with Heather because we just met spontaneously in a restaurant. But by and large, get to know someone very well before you have them fly halfway around the world to get on your boat. And for them, they don't want to spend a lot of money and travel halfway around the world to get on some stranger's boat and they have no idea who this is or or what they're socially like to be with. So 
do your homework. Don't be in a hurry. There are so many websites. If you want to look for cruising mates, there are plenty of them. I've never really used them. I've just spontaneously met people. Thank you. So, Alan, you were um, a pilot before yeah. you started sailing. Can you tell us, how did you become a pilot? Well, um, I was, uh, it goes way back to as a kid. I was 10 or 11 years old, and I was on a flight uh, to visit a relative uh, over a holiday. And uh, in those days, you could go into the cockpit. And so I, at the age of 10 or 11, my brother was with me, and I went up to the cockpit for a while. I could not believe how excited I was. It was a, a TWA airplane. And the day I walked out of there, I said, gee, I would love to be it pilot for TWA and one way or another that's what happened uh, 10 or 12 years later and it was a terrific career I got to see a good bit of the world as did my wife at the time and my kids due to free benefits so um, it's one of those things a dream come true I guess and I understand you did your training um, as part of enlistment for the Vietnam War Can yes uh, I, about that? I was in the military during the Vietnam War and uh, most of the time I was in Washington, D.C., fortunately at the Pentagon and at Andrews Air Force Base, and there was a flying club which you could join because I was not a military pilot. There was a flying club you could join for very little money and learn how to fly, and I did, and eventually actually became a flight instructor and would give lessons and build my hours. So when the airlines were hiring, I had a couple of very lucky breaks, and uh, TWA was hiring, and uh, I was chosen. It was uh, quite quite amazing. I still look back on it because in those days it was more competitive than now. The airlines are screaming for pilots now. So another dream come true. And what are some of your favorite experiences from flying? Um, actually, I have to say the physical act of flying a big airplane. is There's a rush that's exciting. It never got old for me. Um, many takeoffs, many landings, several different kinds of airplanes, one to the other, changing seats as your seniority changes. Uh, just the actual physical flying, other than, of course, you get to see a lot of places and meet some wonderful crew. Uh, but it's the physical flying of the airplane. It's, uh, I've said often, and Heather's heard me say, I spent my, my career at 600 knots, and now I'm living at six knots, and I quite like it now as well. <laughs> So, I understand you were involved in testing the flight suits for some of the moon missions. What was that experience like, and were you confident at the time that a person could successfully land on the moon and return safely? I, I was, but I have to say, uh, in the early 60s, just after President Kennedy announced that by the end of the decade we would go to the moon, they started with the early program called Project Mercury. And that's where they started developing the spacesuits, working in altitude chambers, barometric chambers with different pressures and testing different suits. And uh, I just kind of fell into that because the particular organization I was in was tasked with, with that as, as part of their, their mission. So it was quite interesting. And uh, I, some people say I was a guinea pig, but I think I made some contribution to the design and functionality and how, how mobile the, the early suits you couldn't move too much now they're very different and i understand that you also met president kennedy the day before he was assassinated yeah. what was it like to meet him what, what did it feel like to know yeah. that he was killed the next day absolutely um he came to a place called brooks aerospace medical center in san antonio texas to uh, visit and have a look at the beginning of the space program and part of that was he did come to our facility and see us in our suits and then later uh, there was a luncheon and we spoke very briefly it was very nice and of course you could have no idea that he would die the next day but the next day was November 22nd 1963 he flew over to Dallas and the rest is a tragic history and uh, um, one of those strange things I would like to have met him under different circumstances but uh, I saw him one other time but just briefly it was fascinating and um, a charming guy that's my opinion I won't get into politics well we actually have a political question because we were talking last night and you said most people get more conservative as they get older <laughs> but you you've got more socialist as yeah. you called it what, what are the life experiences that have shaped that viewpoint for you well that's I have to think about how to answer that uh, 
particularly in Europe and the developed world that have socialized medicine, fabulous mass transit, education systems, and uh, socialism is what gives them that. And plenty of people could disagree with me, but uh, I see these examples in other parts of the world. Canada is another example, Australia likely as well. Uh, but I think you, you pay more taxes for sure, but you get something back for those taxes and they don't have the huge military expenses we do. Such a large proportion of our, of our, uh, of our income and revenue goes to military and uh, they don't have that issue. So uh, it's admirable to me and when I hear of people who can get free medical care, they pay, they pay into it somehow, of course. And, and again, the mass transit in Europe is just not to be believed. It's, it puts us to shame in the U.S. So that's, I guess, by example, I've observed systems that I think are working better. And do you think that? Sorry. Do you think that sailing has helped you to, to be more so socialist? Uh, probably not. I can't think how it is, how that would be, other than the people I meet. Yeah, I mean, more for like the, the cruises culture yeah. of like help and share advice yes. and... that's a very good point. Yeah. It is true, and yet I've met some very right-wing conservatives cruising, and uh, sometimes best not to even bring up politics, because you can have a, be having a very nice evening or visit with someone on another boat, and all of a sudden someone starts talking politics, and then things can, can go sideways quickly. Can I just interject there, because my experience of travelling is that when you're mixing with transient people, that their their views do tend to be more liberal, more open, yes. and they're, they're easier people to kind of communicate with and talk to. They haven't got the hang-ups that, I don't know, people that, that don't travel have. It's, it, there is a distinct difference, right. and I'm kind of almost sorry to say that, but, but there is that difference. Yeah. Right. Yeah, I think that's one of the great benefits of travelling. So, so Heather, you set off on your own in a camper van across Europe for months on end. What influenced you to do that? Well, I've all, I've, I've been saying for many years. I ran my own business for 26 years. So, so you run your own business. You work 24/7. And, but I always kept saying, I want to travel, I want to travel. So in my 20s, I lived in Bangladesh for two years and did voluntary work. And then I lived in Germany for two years and had my two children. And I was just hungry to learn the culture, different, different cultures, experience different people and so forth. So uh, yeah, I was learning Italian. Um, it's, it's a bit of a secret, but but my daughter-in-law is is Italian, and I was uh, I, I believe that she will teach my grandson to speak Italian, and I didn't want to be left out of the conversation. So I was learning Italian, and thought, yeah, jump in the van and go to Italy and and see if I can improve, which I didn't at all. <laughs> but, but yeah, I set off set off at the end of October in my camper van, never, never been overseas with it before. In fact, I'd only had it a year and that was constrained usage because, because of COVID and lockdown. And left the UK, went across the channel, drove down through France, over the Alps, drove into Italy. I knew I wanted to get to Sicily, but I didn't know what route I was going to take or when I was going to be there or quite what. So I just went and yeah, did that, drove back decided I might come home for Christmas and then Boris Johnson started talking about Covid and maybe lockdown and it all sounded quite stressful so I turned around, drove back down partially through Italy across France and then uh, spent Christmas in, in Spain and then had to come home after about 88 days so I didn't pass the 90 day <laughs> Brexit requirement. Yeah, that was it. And, uh, it was a good experience. So what were the most special moments of that trip for you? Uh, if I said in hindsight, yeah. <laughs> in hindsight, the most challenging and, and therefore I think the most special but, but made the heart bump a bit was going up into some of the medieval villages in Italy. So these medieval villages are built on the top of mountains. So you're going up there and the roads are really narrow and there are balconies overhanging the roads and the the motorhome is 2.6 meters wide and these are these roads are sometimes like three meters wide and and then they've got 
330 degree bends on them and how on earth do you get a six metre van round that bend and, and yeah I had a few late Italian ladies shouting out their windows at me you know yeah go forward go back go forward go back in Italian um, to get round and some of it was really stressful but but things like that are the real highlights you know they're, they're the challenges and again you can relate that to sailing you know kind of you've got to get through the reefs and you've got to be careful of here and you've got to moor up around other boats and, and so forth so you know again there's those similarities it's interesting so and what are the hardest parts of particularly i think doing it on your own what was what was the hardest part for you i think for me it was winter in italy and therefore the campsites were closed we would say it's staying on sosters which are basically car parks that that give you facilities like water and, and download generally the, the, the black and grey waste but there's very few people on there uh, if any and so you've not got that same social interaction you know and the bars the bars you can go into of an evening but of course the Italians for example don't eat till about eight nine o'clock at night and if you've been up traveling for a long time and it's cold you know in the winter it can get really quite chilly so you and my Italian isn't that good so so to get that social interaction is very different and, and coming here I mean the contrast you can't even compare it you know here we've got the bars and there's lots of chat and by and large it's either in English or in French and you know we we would I don't think we would have had that same interaction as as Alan and I have had right. and and with others so yeah very different I'm going back in June so I have to go back in about four weeks to the UK pick up the van go back to Italy and I'm hoping my experience is going to be very very different because it's going to be summer we're going to be in the tourist season I'm going to be meeting people that that have traveled you know, can share their experiences and, and hopefully, you know, just sit in the bars and the coffee shops and, and just have that social interaction that I really, really did miss. Yeah. And you've touched on this already quite a bit, but what would you say are the main similarities and differences between camper vanning and, and sailing? Um, I guess, I guess with, with the motorhome, at least you, you can you're crossing land, you're going to see different villages and um, and towns. And I, I think with the motorhome, you know, it was easier to get into those towns and into those cultures. I think with, with sailing, my take out is, is that you are pretty much constrained to to the, the towns and the villages along the water's edge. Um, so there is that, that, that difference. Um, having said that, when we were in Karakou, I was there for five weeks and did get the bus an awful lot and moved around and, and got, to, got to know the culture more and, and, and got to meet you know, the local people and that, that was good. But I think there is a risk that, that you can go from kind of almost port to port to bay and, and, and miss out on that, that pure essence of, of, of the people and the cultures. So I think for me that's 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 the big difference. Yeah, absolutely. And what advice would you give to somebody that would love to do what you've done but is maybe too scared? What what advice would you give them? Oh goodness. Well I'm one of those characters where you just get up and go and do things. <laughs> you know, I would just I got I got to Karaku. Well I got I got sailing because I came back from the UK and somebody told me, a friend said there were cheap flights to Cuba, so he and I jumped a plane and went to Cuba for a few weeks and then somebody else I knew said they had a boat in, in Karakou, so why didn't I come over? And, and I came over with the attitude, well if it doesn't work out, then it doesn't work out. I'm an independent traveller, you know, I can jump land and I can sort myself out. And it didn't work out and I did jump land and it was still although it was a little bit stressful at the time because the relationship wasn't quite working between us jumping around was fabulous because i met new people you know and and i got new experiences so so my advice would be yeah just just flex just 
just take that attitude that, 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 that you're by yourself, you can do it. If you meet fabulous people like Alan, you know, and, and many other people that I've met, then things can change. But, but, but not to be reliant, not to be reliant on other people because for me that's a recipe for disaster, you know. Because that can make two people unhappy. Yeah. We, when we set off sailing, didn't we? We 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 said we'd sail across from Karakou to Union Islands. It was it was an hour and a half, you know? <laughs> and we've joked all the way along. At any point, I can get off, you know. And I think that's helped our, our yeah. friendship. There's it's been open ended, you know. There's no goal, no expectation. If it doesn't work out, uh, we split, and so far we haven't. You're going to go home in a few weeks, and. I'm sure we'll survive that amount of time. <laughs> yes. So we normally end on a joke question. Do you want to ask Luciano? Oh, um, Alan, if you could choose like a famous person, can be like, you know, dead or alive, to crew on your boat, who that person will be? Oh my God. The first guy that comes to mind is Elon Musk, because he's so current. I mean, it's not a historical figure. There could be many of those, but. What he's done, his genius, and he's a quirky guy, but my God, what has he done to electric cars, to the space program? He's got us back in space when the government wasn't able to. So if I could if I could have Elon Musk on my boat for a couple of days, it would just be divine, absolutely divine. Heather, um, yeah, my question is really silly, and it might even break a relationship with Alan. <laughs> Does Alan snores? Not that I've heard. He's, he's on the other side of the boat. That's good to make that clear. <laughs> he, he has slept on the, on, the, on the seating here, but I haven't heard him, so all is good. Oh, great. <laughs> That's the beauty of a catamaran. Heather has her hull and I have my hull, and never the twain has met. <laughs> all right, thanks very much, yeah. guys. That was, a, that was really nice. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for watching. We'd like to say a massive thank you to Alan and Heather for those insights and we'll see you in the next episode.